Hello, everyone, and welcome to Chapter 1, Section 2 of Child and Adolescent Development. So we're going to dive in today with behaviorism. So what is behaviorism? It was founded by John B. Watson. Uh, it's a view of development in terms of developing is equivalent to learning. So they agreed with Locke, John Locke, which we learned about last section, uh, experiencing shapes that experiences shape children's knowledge and skills and their preferred activities and items. This is the view of nurture instead of nature in the nature versus nurture debate, which we'll talk about more in the following sections. This is physical and social environments that play a large impact in child development. Examples would be parents in their home life playing a large part in their developmental journey. So nature versus nurture. Nature would be the genetic component of the traits that children have, where nurture is talking about the impact, the environment, and the outside factors have on the development of a child. So how their parents raise them, how their school environment is versus the genetic component. So what we're predisposed to do based on the genetic criteria that we are made up of. So there are a few supporters of the nature versus nurture debate. We're first going to start off with Arnold Gessel. He believed that the bodily maturation impacted development most significantly in the early years of a child's life, so early childhood. He cited heredity, uh, inherited traits, and also genes for a typical development of a child that they went through, or if they didn't go through that, that would be a reason for that, he said. Comparing this to Watson's views, so Gessel saw development as more of a physical component, whereas um, versus the pattern of the behavior the child would gain. So there are theories of child development, First, child development as scientific, there were theories. So these are ideas based on the assumptions that behavior make up. They allow for us to make predictions and gain ideas about different topics based on these behaviors. So I have an example. So Watson's theory that training of a child outweighs the talents of a child. So how we raise them would outshine the talents that they might have naturally. Um, it is time to consider revising this theory if predictions can no longer be based on said theory. So it may be need to be replaced altogether because sometimes this theory can be very inaccurate. Theories help researchers to work um, better with the parents and families and teachers, helping to increase the well being in general of the child and their care. The psychoanalytic perspective of child development is what we're going to cover next. This was uh, attributed to Sigmund Freud. We're going to hear a lot about him through the next few, uh, few sections. Uh, this is the conflict the child faces as they develop into the world around them. So this would be conflicting between internal forces or inner forces. This takes us to the psychosexual development theory uh, by Eric Erickson. He's another guy that we'll talk about throughout the next few sections. He sees children as developing through psychosocial development. So there is the stage theory that we're going to talk about next. This sees children as developing through specific stages and periods of their lives. So children's emotional and social lives are impacted each step of the way. More about Sigmund Freud. So he was known as one of the world's greatest psychologists. He used liberal sexual views, but practiced restraint for himself personally. He focused on social development and emotional development of children. Freud thought that due to child experiences, we only somewhat are aware of the ideas that we actually possess and the impulses that we possess as well. Um, that are in the depths of our minds. So he feels that we are actually not always aware of the tendencies and impulses that we actually have internally. So there are three parts of personally uh, personality according to Freud. It's the id, the ego, and the superego. First, we're going to talk about the id. 
it was present at birth and it's an unconscious part. It's said to be a biological drive uh, for gratification. Next, we're going to talk about the ego. So the ego keeps the mind, uh, the desires of the person, their gratification, but also the actions, um, keeps their actions appropriate as not to be met with disapproval or dissatisfaction by others. It's kind of like the conscience of the person. And finally, we have the superego. So this develops through infancy and early childhood. It cares more about manners, morals, examples given by adults like parents and teachers and family and community. So if a child acts poorly, this will make them feel very ashamed. So more on Freud. He talked about there being five psychosocial stages of child development. If a child does not develop through each of these phases, he said that they'll be fixated on a specific phase. So this was mainly criticized um, for the views because they're very radical. And Erickson and Karen Horney were some of the biggest supporters of these theories and also of Freud in general. And But Karen shared that she felt these theories were very um, radical and should be less sexualized in nature. So we have a few more points about Erickson. So his views of the theories were labeled after uh, life crises, unlike the body parts uh, Freud named them after. There were social relationships and physical maturation impacts of each of these stages. And adolescence is where a sense of identity is formed or lack thereof. So some people would not form um, their own identity in this case. So there are a few important terms that we're going to cover this section. First being behaviorism. So this is Watson's theory going back to the last section. So Watson um, made this theory in which development only focuses on behavior that can be physically seen. We're then going to move on to classical conditioning. When someone makes an association between two different stimuli, which creates a learned response. And finally, operant conditioning, a little different from classical conditioning, is where children learn to do something because of the effects that it causes. So it's a cause and effect relationship. Next, we're going to talk about B.F. Skinner and his reinforcements. So Skinner was actually a behaviorist that came up with the idea of reinforcement. Reinforcement is the presence of a stimuli that increases the prevalence of the behavior that follows it. Operant conditioning relies heavily on the presence of reinforcement. So our reinforcement can actually be positive or negative. It increases the frequency of the behavior when utilized if it's a positive. So this could be something that the child really likes, like a chocolate bar, hugs, a teddy bear, or negative reinforcers uh, increase the frequency of the behavior when they're removed. So this can be a little confusing. So negative is actually the subtraction of the item. So maybe the sweater they're wearing is really itchy and they want to take it off. So once it's taken off, the child is not acting out because the sweater is taken off and they enjoy the feeling of it not being on. Uh, this leads us to punishment, which is the event that is aversive that actually decreases the frequency of the behavior that follows. So the child might get a smack on the hand or maybe a timeout. We have a few more important terms to cover. Shaping is the teaching uh, children by breaking down the tasks into much smaller steps towards a bigger goal. So this could be put with uh, maybe like washing hands, breaking down the steps first, turning on the water, then grabbing the soap, then rubbing your hands together, then turning off the water, and finally drying your hands. For example, a timeout is often used by educators as a way to decrease interactions with positive reinforcement in order to minimize negative behaviors. We have some cognitive theorists to talk about. We're back to John Piaget. Um, he focuses on the mental process of children in general. He researched uh, current intelligence tests from the 1920s while in the process of his PhD. 
He was very focused and interested on incorrect answers actually given by children, which is very interesting as opposed to being focused on the correct because he felt that you could find patterns in the wrong answers in order to become more aware with how children actually think, which is very cool. He also believed that cognitive development directly correlated with the brain maturation and development as well. So we have some of Piaget's basic concepts. We have schema. This is a pattern of mental structure that is involved in gaining or organizing gained knowledge. I have an example for you. So babies have sucking schemas, uh, grasping, looking schemas at their mom, and these are also called reflexes. Uh, we're going to move on to adaption. This is an interaction between something and its environment. So we have many interactions with our environment each and every day as humans. This could be looking around when we hear a noise or talking to a friend. According to Piaget, all organisms adapt to their environment. It is actually a natural biological tendency of humans. Next, we're going to cover assimilation. This is how someone responds to new information, objects, or events, and relates to the existing schemas that they have. I have another example for this. Infants will be in a new um, place with new items and will actually put them in their mouths in order to experience them in a way that is familiar to them. So they'll put them in their mouths and feel for the item because they have that root re reflex about um, putting things in their mouths. Uh, next is accommodation. So this occurs when a new event or idea or piece of information cannot exactly fit in an existing schema. So existing schemas are modified to fit the new idea. Um, next, we have equilibrium. This is mental harmony. Uh, when items and information that is new fits exactly into existing schemas. So we really like this one. So next, we're going to talk about information processing theory. So many cognitive psychologists focused on information processing. Uh, this is how information is input or encoded into the brain when we learn, stored in a person's long-term memory, retrieved, moved to short-term memory, and then processed or manipulated in order to solve a problem. So the solutions for the problem are the output. So then we have biological perspective on development. So this directly correlates with the physical development. So example would be weight gain, height gain or increase, brain development, hormones, reproduction, and heredity. So biology is also intertwined in behavior and what impacts it. Next, we have etiology and evolution, e ethology and evolution. So ethology is actually the behavior pattern that our inch and is an instinct that we are actually born with. So the theory was influenced by Charles Darwin and Conrad Lorenz and also Nico uh, Tinbergen. So this actually says that the nervous system is pre-wired to respond to different situations um, in many animals. And the example given in the book was that many birds are actually pre-wired uh, to fly and leave the nest. So then we bring it to evolution. So how animals change over the course of time to adapt to more effectively to their environments. So this would be um, how different animals change over time in order to uh, best survive in their environments. Next, we have ecology. So this is the relationship between living things and biology and the atmosphere impacting the environment around it. So there's actually an ecological systems theory. This is the study of a child development that speaks to psychosocial, emotional and social development, as well as the biological development of the child. These theorists explain children developing as interactions between children and the settings in which they live and grow. So it is equal parts uh, child development based on what the child has already in uh, physical development, and also the impact of their world around them. 
there are a few different systems we're going to cover. First, we'll start with the microsystem. This is the interaction of the child with their immediate settings. An example would be home or a small group of friends or even school. This leads us to the meso system. This would be multiple uh, settings and how the child interacts with them in the, um, the environment of a microsystem. Uh, an example of this might be a parent-teacher conference where those interactions from home, uh, the parents from home actually get to interact with their system outside of the home, which is the teacher for parent-teacher conferences. There's also an exosystem. So the child is not directly involved in this system per se, but it impacts them. So an example of this would be uh, school board meetings because a child is uh, directly impacted with their education from the school board decisions, but they are not directly involved in the school board meetings and probably don't even know what those are. So we have a few more systems. So we have the macro system. This is involving a child's interactions with expectations in their lives, values, beliefs, and cultures that are in their lives as well. This leads us to the chrono system. So this is the changes that occur over the time uh, that impact the child in their development. Think ch for, or ch or ch for chrome, chrono system and ch or ch for changes. So an example of this would be uh, the effects of divorce on a young child and the lasting trauma in the years to come as they heal from the loss and change. That's another C word, CH word change. The social uh, cultural perspective on development is next. So children are social beings that are impacted by the cultures and different environments around them as they live and learn and grow. Children are impacted by cultures, customs, different traditions that they're exposed to, and heritages within their social society that they live. So the social cultural theory was created by Lev Simonovich Vygotsky, uh, a Russian psychologist that we will hear about in the chapters to come. It also addresses the impact of human diversity, such as gender and ethnicity, and how, what that means for a child and how it impacts them. This is also concerned with how cognitive skills are passed from generation to generation to the child. We have a few more key terms. So there is a zone of proximal development. Uh, this is a close zone in which it encompasses the tasks that the child can accomplish with the help of somebody that is a little more skilled than them. An example would be an adult. Uh, this is key concept in Vygotsky's theory. So maybe the child can't tie their shoes independently, but with the help of an adult or an older child, they are able to do it. So that would be in their zone of proximal development. They can almost do it. They can do it with help, but they cannot do it by themselves. Next, we have scaffolding. This is a problem solving method given to children to use until the child is able to actually function independently without the help of the scaffold. This is also important in Vygotsky's theory. So this might be a visual aid on how to tie the shoes that the child uses until they are able to fully, um, fully tie their shoes by themselves without the help of the aid or uh, the adult. Next, we're going to talk about ethnic groups and socioeconomic status. So first, ethnic groups. They are language, race, and cultural heritage that are common, uh, common history of the child in the home that they identify with. Next, we have the socioeconomic status. This is an economic situation that puts children in a position in the society. So education level is often directly correlated to the SES of a child. So for example, um, children of a higher SES are most likely going to have different, um, different gifts afforded to them than children who are not. Um, an example would be um, if, a if a family is wealthier, their children usually attend school for longer they often have access to many resources like education, um, private education, good tutoring, safe schools, to name a few. And that is the end of our section, and I will see you next section. I hope you had a great day.